Now, back in July of 1994, Disney opened up the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror at the then Disney MGM Studios. And now, 20 years later, we're still celebrating this wonderful attraction. It's got versions all over the world, and we're very lucky to be joined by a special guest, Mark Silverman, who is the voice of Rod Serling for the Tower of Terror. How are you doing, Mark? All right, I love being here. Yeah, we love having you here. Now, you, you've done Rod Serling, you've done a lot of other voice work. Did you always want to be a voiceover artist when you were a kid? Well, I, I did a lot of impressions as a kid. I would watch Get Smart, for instance, and I would go, would you believe I'm Maxwell Smartage in 86? Of course. You know, I had a natural way of mimicking people. I used to imitate the teachers, you know, and I, I got into voiceover because of that. And about uh, five years after I started to professionally do it, the Tower of Terror audition came up. And uh, you always watched Twilight Zone as a kid as well? I was fanatical about Twilight Zone and fanatical about Disneyland. So perfect that, that, was it something that Disney contacted you or did you go audition for it? A friend of mine called me and said that his agent was looking for a Rod Serling voice for a Disney attraction, which sounded weird to me. I couldn't connect Twilight Zone and Disney made no sense to me at that time, you know. <laughs> but uh, I went and auditioned and it's so hard to get voice work that you do the audition and you don't even think about it. So, but then like two weeks later, that the, the woman that I auditioned with said, you know, that thing you did, you came in for Rod Serling, it didn't die. They want to see you at Imagineering for another audition. You know, I still have the cassette that she said that on, you know. Oh. And I was actually more excited just to get into Imagineering because I thought, <laughs> wow, I'm finally in there. That'll be neat. Yeah, yeah. So I, I kept auditioning like three more auditions and then I finally got it. And that was how that happened. Now, uh, a lot of the dialogue in the Tower of Terror is spe specially written for the ride, but there's one piece in the pre-show that they pulled from It's a Good Life of Rod Serling actually on camera, and you had to mimic exactly the spacing. How long did it take to get that down? I had already revoiced several people and a lot of celebrities at that point, so I had a real knack for the timing and rhythm of that. Mm -hmm. So that only took about probably 20 minutes. They brought out a monitor and I watched it and they give you beeps and you know exactly when to start talking. And uh, it ran really smooth and it came out great. And uh, about how long was it before they called you in to record some new dialogue for the California version? That was about a year before that ride opened. Uh, so yeah, sometime in a night, wait, 2004 it opened. So yeah, it was like 10 years before that. No, no, wait, but no, uh, like a year before that, mm -hmm. 2002 or three. Okay, and uh, do you ever find yourself, you know, having fun with people on a random elevator? Just of course. <laughs> That's my, you know, I've done that a few times. You go into an elevator at a mall and the doors close. You were the passengers in a most uncommon <laughs> elevator. Sometimes people, they think it's funny. Sometimes they don't know what's going on. Sometimes they applaud. You know, I know friends that just meet me at a mall and they'll get into an elevator and I'll do it and they'll, It'll give their day a little Disney, you know. It's without going to the parks, they'll still get a little feeling for being on the ride, you know. So I accommodate them. What the hell? Yeah, yeah. And um, you've done. So talk about a little bit of some of the other work you've done outside of Tower of Terror. Well, if you get there's several Bambi projects that I was cast as the voice of Friend Owl. Now Friend Owl sounds like an old man. <laughs> <laughs> Bambi, which is very exciting for me because I'm actually the voice of a Disney character. So that was good. I love doing that. And actually in Magic Kingdom the other day, I, I, there's a game called Treasure of the Seven Seas. And I'm the voice of a pirate in that. Oh. I'm a voice of a very fancy Spanish pirate that sounds remarkably like Ricardo Montalban. <laughs> and he says, foolish piratas. You know, that was great because I got to stand there in Magic Kingdom and hear my voice blasting out, which was very exciting. D does that ever happen where you, you would go record something for a project and you kind of forget about it and then you hear it you're like, oh, I forgot I did that? Yes, but when it's something, you know, as, as far as something big, I always know it's there. But like I was, uh, I saw the Canada movie, the Circle Vision thing. Mm -hmm. I'm a few voices in that real quiet in the background. Like, uh, I think there's a rodeo scene and you hear me go, yahoo, or something like that. And I had forgot about that, so it was kind of funny to see that. And uh, what do you got going on nowadays? What can people look out for you for? I'm a few voices in the Lego video game. That's a tie-in to that movie. I'm the voice of Abraham Lincoln, who's got a, a few lines, you know, so I'm, I've done a few video games lately, but I, I want to do more and more, whatever the case may be. 
Now, uh, the big question uh, uh, from all Tower fans have to ask this, and you got to let me know. Florida version or California version? What's your, what's your pick? Well, I like the original version because you have the fifth dimension area. Exactly. You see giant eyeballs, mm -hmm. which is spectacular. I, I mean, any ride that has giant eyeballs, I want to go see that. <laughs> So, uh, and, I, yeah, and I thought that was such a weird thing that an elevator would leave the drop shaft and walk forward is so weird. And they mm -hmm. pull, and that is probably the most surreal thing the Imagineers have ever done, that fifth dimension. Because it doesn't really make sense. It's just something they kind of created to make, and they never even showed the fifth dimension on an episode. I think the little girl lost episode where she went under, under the, the bed. Wall. Yeah, or, they, yeah. They, they, they did a little with that. So the Imagineers really had to come up with something, and I, I love that part. What's your favorite little hidden piece of Twilight Zone history that's scattered throughout the ride? I love in this version, they have the To Serve Man book in the library. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to see, and if you don't know that episode, you would never even know it's there. And I think that's really neat. Although, in the California Adventure version, they have that chalk outline from the Little Girl Lost episode, and if you linger around there, you'll hear the little girl crying for her mommy coming out of the wall. I'm telling you, that has got to be the creepiest thing the Imagineers have ever gotten through on an attraction. I had no idea about that. Yeah, but oh. out here, they have the circle, the chalk outline when you leave, when you exit the ride, but there's no kid screaming out of the wall on that one. Wow. That's, that's the best thing, I think. Next time I'll have to give you an eye or an ear out for that one. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Mark, thanks again so much for coming in and talking hey, to us. It's it was a pleasure. Great.